Welcome to the Business Scholarship Podcast, interdisciplinary conversations about new works in the broad world of business research. I'm your host, Andrew Jennings. If you like what you hear today, please consider subscribing to the podcast or sharing with others who might like it too. And if you have ideas for future episodes, let me know. My email address is andrew at andrewkjennings.com, and I look forward to hearing from you. Our guest today is Carlos Chapman, an associate professor of law at Washington Lee University. We'll be discussing your article, Corporate Family Matters, which is forthcoming in the UC Irvine Law Review. I'll have a link to the article in the show notes for the episode. Carlos, welcome back to the Business Scholarship Podcast. Thanks for having me. Carlos, when we look at a prominent company like McDonald's Corporation or Apple Inc., you note that that isn't all that there is. A company is, in fact, a group of entities organized as a variety of different forms, be it corporations or LLCs or limited partnerships and the like. Could you introduce this terrain to us, this idea that you refer to as corporate families? Yes. We're all familiar with the idea of conglomerates and groups. And in forming those conglomerates and groups, the principles of separateness govern. The idea that each of those companies is a separate entity with separate management And we have the concept of enterprise liability that defines when a parent can be responsible for a subsidiary, when they can can interact with each other and be responsible for each other. And that's generally defined by control. And in my paper, what I suggest is that there are times when control is not what we should be looking to. We should instead be thinking about influence. And I think about influence in multiple ways, not just of one company over another, not just when a subsidiary is actually working for the benefit of the parent. But I also think about people like Elon Musk and others that can have cult of personality influence over an entire family of entities that are connected or not. And I think that Thinking about these things in a different way, thinking about the families as opposed to just the groups, can get at a lot of the sources of previous fraud scandals and also gets at what people who are doing impact investing, people who are concerned with corporate social responsibility, people who are trying to buy from a Black-owned business or from a business that advances their causes. It's the kind of information that they need, even if It's not the kind of information that we currently deem as material and that we think can move the market. Your paper focuses on the use or the potential use of corporate families for those who want to engage in wrongdoing or engage in other practices that, even if they're not wrongful per se, might still be problematic. How do corporate families facilitate fraud or other wrongful acts, and how have they done so in the past? I think of this concept I call head in the sand and silos. And what that means is because of separateness, it is possible to silo information amongst entities. And if you are someone who works for an individual entity that is working for the benefit of an individual or working for the benefit of a parent, because of personhood and how it is used to define business relationships, you have the right to bury your head in the sand. I like to use Enron as an example and the lawyers and accountants at Enron as an example to illustrate this concept. So Enron, you had Enron Parent and you had a lot of special purpose entities, hundreds of them, that were created and managed by Enron employees or other people who were incentivized to do what the bad actors wanted to do. But then you also had attorneys and experts who used the fact that these entities are separate and each of them is an individual person and each of them is an individual client to say, well, I am only retained to represent special purpose entity. I'm not retained to represent Enron parent. So I can't consider these other factors or I'm not supposed to consider these other factors or I don't have reason to investigate. We also have the problem of when it comes to reporting for SEC purposes, for attorney disciplinary purposes, for other purposes, they all contemplate the top of the chain before going external. Well, if you silo information and silo bad actions in separate entities, the top of the chain is the management of that individual entity. It is not the board of directors of the parent. Enron, again, is a great example for this. And it just so happens that at Enron, Arthur Anderson was doing work for all of them. Some of the law firms were doing works for both the subsidiaries and the parents. I think that people don't make that mistake anymore. I think people are far more deliberate about defining who the client is and who they're representing so that they don't have an Enron problem. One thing I 
try to do in the paper, I'm anticipating what I see to be a new way to commit fraud. You know, in many ways, I think Sarbanes and the changes that came out of Enron have just taught companies how to get away with fraud better. We built a mousetrap and now we've built smarter mice. What is evident now is really the market manipulation and the manipulation of public opinion. But I think that behind the surface, there could be things that we as investors, as consumers just don't see. And those silos enable companies to take advantage. You discuss Sarbanes-Oxley as potentially encouraging or teaching companies how to engage in wrongdoing with the siloed effect of corporate families. Beyond that, how does law currently address this issue, whether that's statutory, regulatory, judicial decisions, or maybe academic doctrines that we talk about? Or to what extent does the law not address some of these issues? I think what we have now is a lot of governance by hindsight. It takes something to go wrong for us to contemplate enterprise liability, which is the best way, which is a form of veil piercing between entities, or it takes a major market scandal for the federal government to intervene and say this form of market manipulation is problematic. In theory, antitrust should get at it. You know, it, antitrust could get at it as it as it crosses an entire enterprise. But what I see the problem is is that we have this unregulated space of what is happening amongst a single enterprise. And I think it results in us finding things out too late. Another problem, in theory, fiduciary duty litigation should get at this. And that's what we have in the Elon Musk example. We have those shareholders seeing Elon Musk involved in the Tesla acquisition of Solar City filing fiduciary duties litigation, and then we can get into the relationship of the businesses being too close. We get into Elon Musk being defined as a controlling shareholder. We get all of these things out of the fiduciary duty litigation. But fiduciary duty litigation is expensive. It's cost prohibitive. It requires a lot of discovery. It's very hard to survive a motion to dismiss and even get to summary judgment. You've got to change the standard of review somehow really to survive. And so if what we're counting on is a combination of federal market regulation through discovery of a big scandal, fiduciary duty litigation, or antitrust regulation, we really don't have governance of what corporations are able to do across a body of companies, across a family of entities. You propose a definition for corporate family groups and being able to identify corporate family groups. Could you share that definition and the impacts you expect it might have on corporate law and theory? What impacts might there be on corporate compliance and transparency? And who are the responsible actors, be it state or federal authorities, who might need to implement some reforms on this front? I take the Delaware Code, which is the statute that we refer to most often when it comes to corporate law, since so many multinational corporations are incorporated in Delaware. And I add a statute to the code. And in my definition of families, I am concerned about an excessive expansion of enterprise liability. That is not my goal. My goal is not to just mandate veil piercing across entities in all circumstances. And so what I do is I add a limit that we have in civil procedure called the real party and interest standard. And in civil procedure, what often happens, and I I litigated for 11 years doing complex commercial litigation, and I would see this happen often in practice, where if there was tort litigation or a breach of contract suit, a judge would often allow for other entities to be added to the lawsuit, even if Per our definitions in corporate law, they should not be added. And it was based on the idea of making sure the person who is responsible pays. And and judges felt like we can sort out later who's really responsible, but for now, equity demands that we add it in. But I add to the Delaware Code, I add a section on corporate families. And my definition is a corporate family contains at least one entity organized under this chapter whose certificate of incorporation contains the provisions required by section 102 of this title. And in addition, that entity shares ownership or management with another entity, owns another entity, or is wholly owned by another entity. And the entities operate for the promotion of the parent's business purposes or the owner's business interests. 
When this definition is met, the corporation must look to the real party and in interest and acknowledge the influence of a parent corporation, shareholder, director, or officer instead of relying on control when determining controlling shareholders, the requirements of reporting and other regulatory standards that apply to corporate groups, and conflicts of interest. The reason I focus on those three areas, controlling shareholders, requirements of reporting, and conflicts of interest, is those are areas that I think this definition matters most. If you change when you determine controlling shareholders, that changes the standard of review in fiduciary duty litigation. If you change the reporting requirements under the SEC or other statutes, that could enable shareholders and consumers to get disclosures about who's really making the products, who's really signing the contracts. And when we look at conflicts of interest, either amongst shareholders and directors or amongst professional services, that gets into the situation when someone is in a special relationship of trust with the entity, but may not be acting in the best interest of that entity. The things that I would like for this definition to change most are access to the courts by shareholders and investors. One, by either lowering the standard of review or expanding what they have access to when they exercise inspection rights. And even just with torts and contracts, helping people be able to figure out who they really should be suing in the first place, which kind of happens already with the procedural elements. When it comes to the reporting mechanisms, SEC disclosures, 10Ks, 10Qs, and 8Ks, my hope is that it changes the definition of what's material and can get at what investors and consumers really want to know. I use the example of Live Nation's relationship with Rock Nation and also the NFL to just illustrate that as a consumer, not as an investor, some of these relationships would be troubling to me if I am purchasing from a company because I think that they promote social justice. And then when it comes again to conflicts, I think about the Enron situation specifically, but also Tesla. The idea that when we combine the standard for conflicts of interest, shareholders, and external reporting, we could get a clearer picture of what Elon Musk is doing across these entities. And maybe we would all still want to invest in Tesla if we knew, but maybe there are people who would want nothing to do with it when they feel like it's an empire controlled by one man. What key takeaways would you like listeners to have from this conversation and paper? And are there open questions that still need to be answered in this topic of corporate families? I'll start with the open questions. I really think this proposal is a first step. And that is why I chose to work with the definition of families as a subset of groups instead of thinking about groups as a whole. But one question that sparked this paper is the idea of a federal corporate statute or the ideas that people have had about stakeholder governance and other ideas about what happens when corporations can get to be mega big, like a Facebook or a Google, not trigger any trust, but still have what people perceive to be undue influence on the market or not pay their fair share of taxes or do other things that upset the sensibilities, but that are not illegal. And my thought is that some of the writing that we're doing in those areas, some of the statutes we're proposing may be too far too fast. And I'm generally not an incrementalist, but in this situation, I think that we keep ignoring the fact that states have the power to define entities. And I think that there may be a simpler fix to all of this. It could be my definition of families. It could be that states start to think more about big corporations and conglomerates in the statutory level in general. And I don't think we always need to jump to a federal regime that is more reporting or more disclosure or more fines or more regulation when we've got this fertile ground of state law to play with. And so if I think about what the takeaways that I would like people to get out of the paper and and out of this talk, it's that we should remember where corporate personhood comes from and what the concept is and what it is intended to do. It's not intended to create super citizens via corporations. It's intended to enable us as individuals to address our rights with corporations and against corporations. It's intended to give us the ability to collectively bring our funds together with limited liability and be innovative. And if we don't want to stifle that innovation and we don't want to stifle creativity, but we also want to prevent fraud and prevent harm to the market, I truly believe we should look more 
at these state law definitions before we jump to let's create a big federal regime. Let's create a separate federal corporation for large multinationals. Our guest today has been Carlos Chapman, Associate Professor of Law at Washington Lee University. We've discussed her article, Corporate Family Matters, which is forthcoming in the UC Irvine Law Review. I'll link to the article in the show notes for the episode. Carlos, thank you for joining the Business Scholarship Podcast. Thank you for having me. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Business Scholarship Podcast. If you like what you heard, please consider subscribing to the podcast or leaving a rating on your favorite podcast app, or let other people know about it too. If you have suggestions for future episodes, please let me know. My email address is andrew at andrewkjennings.com, and I look forward to hearing from you. Until the next time, I'm your host, Andrew Jennings.